The workday tends to blow by quickly when you're a trader, which is a good thing, but it ain't all sunshine and rainbows. One of the worst things that can happen is to get the directional thesis right, but the trade structure wrong. We're going to talk about Foot Locker earnings today on Open Interest. Hi there, I'm Mike Coe. Welcome to Open Mic, sponsored by Options Play. Thank you for tuning in. If you have questions or comments, please be sure to leave them in the comments section on the Open Interest YouTube channel. I apologize as I don't see posts on X at the moment, but hopefully we'll find a way to interact with those pretty soon. So I mentioned trading ain't all sunshine and rainbows. And for one thing, if you're like me on the West Coast, there's no sunshine at all when you get to the desk at 4.30 in the morning. But you do start to get used to that. What you don't get used to, though, is when you get the direction of your trade correct, but the trade isn't profitable. And that was actually the case in the Foot Locker trade that we talked about on Monday. And I'd like to get into uh, what was going on there. So first things first. Uh, just if there's anybody here who's watching who didn't watch uh, that live stream, this was the, the gist of the thesis. Uh, Foot Locker was up about 9% uh, year to date uh, as of Monday, thereabouts. Uh, meanwhile, Nike was down a little over 8%. Nike is Foot Locker's largest supplier, represents over 8% of their sales. And Another important point about that was that Nike had reported at the tail end of 2023, Nike had reported their earnings well after Foot Locker had reported theirs. Uh, and they highlighted that they expected their sales to decline somewhat precipitously. So if you take some read through, uh, and I think this is an important idea generally when you're just thinking about how you invest, how I think about things, because uh, you're usually looking for information that's going to come in from the side. And the reason I say information that comes in from the side is because we can all figure out what the PE of a stock is, uh, especially on a trailing basis. They report a number, you see the share price, you divide one by the other, and that's your PE. There is no magic in doing that. There's nothing uh, super secret that everybody can't figure out. So if you're going to try to find some edge in a trade, chances are you need to be able to look at that and say, OK, I'm comfortable owning the business or I'm not comfortable owning the business. But what you're really looking for are any businesses that are in proximity to the one you're looking at that might be giving you some clues as to what might be coming next. To me, Nike was giving us some clues. And what added to that still further was the fact that Nike was performing very badly through the year. To what could we owe this huge disconnect? Why was Nike, a much bigger company, by the way, that more people are examining this thing is going down, Foot Locker was going up, that struck me as very fishy, uh, and so I was bearish on Foot Locker. And the trade that I highlighted uh, as a way to potentially play it, because the premiums were very high, was trading a, uh, a put calendar. And so maybe we can just take a quick look at what a trade like that is. And actually, I'm going to pick a different example because this thing obviously has, uh, has dropped quite a lot. It's down 30% today. So being bearish after they reported earnings. So being bearish proved to be right. Why was the put calendar not such a great trade? So uh, actually my trading screen is now closed, but I had the 30s on myself. So I had mentioned actually when I started that live stream that I already had a trade on. So when we were framing up one ourselves, um, that was after I already had one on. So I was in a, uh, a, in a calendar that goes out on the 30 strike. And we're obviously well below the 30 strike now. How does a trade like this make money? Well, let's, let's just take a look. And you know what? We might as well just use Nike since we were talking about Nike anyway uh, as an example. So we're just going to... Uh, let's see here. Uh, okay. Uh, let's see. Oh, I see. Okay. Hang on a second. I'm going to... I think I am sharing this improperly, so you're not seeing that quite the right way. So I'm going to stop sharing that. This is uh, the beauty of, of live streaming when you don't have a whole lot of practice. So thank you for bearing with me while I quickly figure this out. I just want to make sure that everybody can see what's going on. All right. Some comments I got before, by the way, was that 
whenever we put something really small on the screen, and you know, when you're looking at trading screens, there's like usually a lot of small numbers. So we're gonna try to make sure that things are as visible as they possibly can be. Okay, so uh, hopefully, how about now? Are we, uh, are we seeing this? Okay, uh, give me one more moment while I figure out how to share my screen here. Okay. And I have quite a few screens, seven on, seven on these, these computers here, so you'll forgive me for just one moment while I uh, sort that out. Okay. There we are. This, how about now? Uh, anybody who's watching this, if you would like to just throw a, a comment, please let me know if you can actually see what's going on. Okay, so here we go. Um, what is a calendar spread? Sorry for those technical snafus. I'm bound to have a lot of them because I'm used to doing a lot of talking, but not that much driving while I talk. Can't walk and chew gum, this guy. Okay, so a calendar spread, and I usually trade long calendars. So that means, when I say a long calendar spread, that means I'm buying an option that has a longer amount of time to expiration or maturity, and I'm selling a nearer dated one. Okay, so we're gonna get to Foot Locker in a second. Nike being the signal that I took to take a bearish posture in Foot Locker to begin with, we're just gonna use this one as an example. So stock right now, about 97 and a half bucks. If I was just gonna say, for example, use a call calendar, I might buy the June 100s, and then I might sell a near dated option just for the you know, simplicity. We're just gonna say it's regular way uh, March, so I would sell that option. Okay, um, so and that has to be a call there. All right, you get a payoff that looks a little something like this. Okay, so it's a little bit like a short straddle uh, without the completely unlimited risk that would accompany uh, selling a short straddle. If you sell a short straddle, that means you're short a call and you're short a put of the same strike and expiration. And basically, you have unlimited risk to the upside if the stock takes off, and you have risk all the way to the downside. In this particular instance, you can see the attractiveness isn't all that great of this trade. And the reason is because it's a very narrow band of profitability that you have here. So we can actually look right here, and we can see the downside profitability, uh, downside break even right here, and the upside break even right here. And then this whole region in here where you're not gonna see profits. Nice thing here is we actually get a probability of profit calculator, so it says, look, you have about a 55% chance of, of making money if you uh, put this trade on. All right, if you go further out in time, the premium you're collecting for the option you sell is going to go up. And consequently, the break-evens for this trade will widen as we see here. Um, so our probability of profit has risen, the maximum amount we can make has gone up, the maximum amount we can lose has gone down, and uh, so this looks a little bit better. An important thing to understand about options pricing is that two things that affect the value of an option have kind of a common impact. Uh, and those two things are time, and volatility, the volatility of the underlying uh, and the implied volatility as a, associated with the options price. And this should make some intuitive sense to us for the following reason. If you're thinking that something could happen, the likelihood of it happening increases the more time you give it to happen or the more volatile things are in the meantime, right? So what happened in Foot Locker? In Foot Locker, this had a very high implied volatility. That's why we were inclined to sell the uh, shorter dated options. And the idea was that we would profit if the stock stood still, if it fell down to the strikes of the options that we had traded, which as I pointed out was actually the 30 strikes. So now we're gonna go to Foot Locker. This is the actual trade now. So we're gonna put this thing in, but we're putting it in at the prevailing price that we have today. And what we're gonna see is, okay, it looked great when we put it on, it doesn't look as great now. And the reason for that is that there's no extrinsic premium left 
in these shorter dated options that we are in here. So it doesn't really matter whether it's a call uh, spread or, or put spread either way. Okay. Um, so actually I'm gonna flip this to calls because I think that's just a little bit more realistic because I like to think of every strike that's out of the money to the upside as a call strike, every strike that's out of the money uh, to the downside as a put strike. That's because I hedge most of my options trades so that I'm essentially delta neutral. So I care most about whether I'm long or short the strike, long or short the expiration. Those are the things that matter to me most. But ignoring that, let's just take a look at this trade. And what we see is, okay, this is the trade that we are now in. So we entered this trade on Monday, but this is what we're left with now. And the question we want to ask ourselves is, okay, and this is looking forward to March expiration. So this looks just dandy if the stock gets up to that strike of the calendar spread that we're in, but it has to do that by March 15th. That's a week from Friday. And we just got some pretty ugly news in Foot Locker. What are the chances that it gets back to 30 where we see peak profits by next Friday? The answer is it's not that great. So uh, my, you know, the position I was in, you know, if anybody else entered that trade, I don't know, per spread, it was probably down about 100 and I think mine, we were down about $131 a spread. Um, so if you want this trade to work, you need to try to set those strikes so that you're in a boundary where you think the stock could actually land. This, the chances that the stock gets back to 30 bucks which is, you know, we're $24 now, an increase of $6. So that's a pretty big increase from, from where we are right now. By Friday, in the absence of some really good news, is, is slim. And by the way, like I said, I was bearish on the stock to begin with. It just proved to be even bigger disappointment than I thought it could be. So I set what I thought was a low bar, um, and it undershot. So what I would consider doing here, actually, is just adjusting these strikes down to something that's a little bit more realistic. Um, so more realistic in this case is gonna be something that's closer to uh, at the money. And now you could do something like that. The other thing is that I probably would just stretch this out a little bit more in terms of time. We're not gonna get another earnings or anything like that. So you could do a little something like that. Now, one other point, and I think this is there will probably be people, and, if, and by the way, if you are, um, if there's anybody who's long, who's watching, who's long Foot Locker, I'd like to hear from you. Um, because there is something for those of you who might have been more bullish about the stock going into earnings than I was. Some things that you can do with options that, that might actually get you a little, um, a little extra profits in the event that it, it catches a bid. Um, so we, we have something called a stock recovery strategy. We can get into that in a second. In the meantime, though, having covered uh, that trade, which uh, is, you know, turned out to be even less fun than getting up at 3.30, 3.45-ish, which is what I usually do and come stumbling in here about 4. Um, you'll have to forgive me because this morning you'll notice so, no fancy shirt, no makeup artists on a live stream. You know, that's, uh, that's only CNBC stuff that we get there. Okay, so why don't we take a couple questions and see what we have. So um, I'm just gonna grab this first one. By the way, please leave all those questions. I'm gonna try to start making a habit of responding to all of them in the comments. What I didn't realize was I, on the earlier live streams was I was accidentally deleting those comments so I couldn't go back and answer them. I will try to answer as many of those as I can in writing if I don't get to them here. Okay, so what is this question? Uh, Ranjana Gupta asks, what do you think of an April 12, 77 and a half strike naked put on XLC? Uh, and I don't know if this uh, question is making it out to you all who are watching. I hope you are seeing this. I, there we go. All right, I'm going to read that question, but we'll we'll get to it. So again, Ranjana Gupta asks, what do you think of an April 12th, 77 and a half strike naked put on XLC? Well, let's take a look at that. And that's the other thing. I'm going to try to really make sure that I'm showing things on my screen because I can 
telling people isn't really as good as showing. So I'm going to try to make a better effort to do that too. Um, okay, so we're going to take a look at this. April 12th, which is actually a weekly, and you are looking at the 70 and a half strike put. You are looking to sell this thing. Make, what does that look like? Okay. And there's a great question coming up here about uh, Vol Crush and Nike, which I definitely want to get to. All right. So, uh, XLC. Um, this is what that trade looks like. Okay. Uh, and anybody who is familiar with, say, doing a covered call, uh, otherwise sometimes known as a buy right, where you buy a stock and you sell a call against it to collect a little bit of additional premium. Selling a cash covered put, that's effectively a very similar trade. And you'll see that payoff uh, right here. So that's the payoff profile. So if you sell a downside put, you could potentially have the stock put to you. You will own it. You won't see losses until the stock drops below the strike of the put you sold by at least as much premium as you collected. So let's take a look at this one in particular and see what we see about it. Okay, so a couple of things. First of all, you're collecting $2.75 against that 77 and a half strike. So if you think of that strike kind of like your risk, which I think is actually a reasonable way to think about things, um, you're collecting about 3.5% on that trade, which expires in just over a month, right? So it is March 5th, 6th today. So it's March 6th today. That's going to go out to April 12th. So, you know, this is uh, five, six weeks away. I guess that's six weeks, right? Um, you're collecting 3.55% on your risk, which is the risk that you get put stock, that you're going to own the stock over the course of that six weeks. And I think that's a pretty attractive rate of return. Now, whether that's an attractive rate of return, and this is really important, is a function of what you are selling the put on. XLC is actually a pretty stable underlying instrument. So what this is the communications ETF, what's in it? Um, well, as you would expect, some of the big you know, telecom stocks are talking about Verizon and AT&T and things like that, but also Google Alphabet is in this. So it doesn't have very high volatility. So uh, I think this is a reasonable um, a reasonable rate of return over a reasonable period. I like the fact that you're not going way out in time. And a nice interesting thing about ETFs, by the way, which I think is well worth mentioning, that is that they don't face what we call idiosyncratic risk. XLC is not going to report earnings. The constituents within the ETF are going to report earnings, and when they do, those things can move fairly sharply, not as sharply as Foot Locker did on their earnings most likely, but that's the point. When you start selling options premiums going into events such as earnings, that's when you can find yourself getting into real trouble. Imagine if someone had done that uh, sort of premium chasing in Foot Locker. That would have been, been quite ugly. Okay. What do we have here? Um, next question. How can you protect a naked May 235 Tesla put? Well, let's take a look at the May 235 Tesla put. And uh, actually, this is kind of an interesting one because this, I'm trying to think when you might have gotten into this trade. It must have been a little while ago. Uh, and I say that because the stock, as we can all see, is actually well below this price now. So this trade, by the way, bears a lot of similarity to the one we were just looking at in a way. Um, so this is a little bit like doing a covered call as well. If you were to initiate this trade now, which I don't recommend, why do I not recommend it? Well, if you are, in, and we're going to deal with how you kind of handle a trade like this, assuming you're in it. But if you're looking at this right now saying, okay, well, is this a trade that Mike's recommending? The answer is no. Why am I not recommending it right now? That's not to say that I wouldn't have recommended it then. I'm not using, you know, the benefit of hindsight here, but why wouldn't I rec uh, do it now? When you, sell, uh, when you sell a cash covered put or even a naked put, or if you're selling a covered call, 
you are doing that for a specific reason. You are looking to collect premium. You are looking to get a yield. You are looking to get income. This trade doesn't do that. And you can see that on this chart right here. You can see that because you'll notice that at spot, at the current stock price, there's no profit or loss. So basically, at the moment, this trade behaves exactly like stock would, which is fine. You know, whether you're long Tesla, short Tesla, that's not really the point. But this doesn't really behave anything like an options trade until it gets back to the strike that you're short. And then notice you have negative convexity there. Negative convexity meaning that the bend is working against you and you don't want that. So, and why is that? The reason is because the stock blew through that strike and it declined to a degree that there's no extrinsic premium left in the option. When I am short options, and I'm short a lot of them actually, I'm on, you know, we have positions on 50, 60 stocks right now. I own a lot of index. I'm short a lot of uh, options against single stock. Um, I cover options the instant there's no extrinsic premium. In fact, actually, we have an even you know, more aggressive rule than that. The instant that the yield on that is less than five basis points a day, we cover it right then and there. Um, so everybody can set that threshold a little bit differently. But I have no interest in being short options where I'm not getting paid to be short them. And this does two things. Number one, it makes sure that you're always going to be collecting theta on your short options portfolio, which is what you want if you're going to be short options in the first place. And that's the other point. I'm not interested in selling options, you know, optionality for nothing. I don't, I don't care how unlikely the event is. I'll let the government go out and sell lottery tickets. I'm not in that business. So... We're not, you know, we're not going to do that. So what do you do about a trade like this? Well, the first thing is that once it starts running through your strike, that's when you really want to start thinking about managing it. And like I said, the instant that that extrinsic premium has gone away, you are not being paid to continue to be shorted. And therefore, you don't want to. Now, you could replace it with the stock, so you would actually still have the upside. That would actually be a more favorable characteristic, in my view. Or you could actually roll down, and you will probably be taking a loss to do that. But if you do this consistently and manage it, eventually the income's going to help you out. What might that look like? Well, the option you would want to be short would be the option that's closest to the money or just out of it, because that's the one that's going to be paying you some premium. This one also has a little bit too much time to go to expiration, I have to say. So the X... Um, the XLC put right that we were just looking at a second ago, that one expired in less than 45 days. This one's being 72 days. And again, I don't know when you initiated this trade, but here's something just to think about. And that is if you're selling premium out a long period of time, not only does that just, look, a lot can happen over an extensive period of time. But the other problem is that you might be selling premium into a material event. And that's really... Uh, something that you want to be kind of careful about. So, you know, do you want to sell puts on Tesla right before they're going to report earnings? Some people are tempted to do that because the premium is elevated. But actually, that's when most of the moves take place. 40% of the moves for a single stock in a year are likely to occur around just the earnings events. That's where a lot of the volatility happens. So I'd rather collect 30% annualized implied volatility between those events and then try to play for the event then be short through the event, if that makes sense. I hope it does. So um, since this one's already relatively far away, I'm actually going to just use a different example and just so we can just sort of think about how you might manage a trade like this. Let's imagine that you had done April. Um, we'll look at April 12th because that's what the XLC trade was. So why not? Uh, we'll take a look at this one. We're going to try to find uh, a strike that you would say, okay, I think it's about time that we start covering this thing. So we're going to look for something that doesn't have a whole lot of extrinsic premium in it, but it's in the money. Stock's 176. Let's see how the 200s look. Okay. So there's the 200 put. So let's take, this is, this is getting into that borderline case that we're talking about, right? So let's assume you had sold the April 12th weekly 200 strike put in Tesla and now you're faced with this rather unhappy situation. We can see that the stock has declined fairly significantly. 
And a lot of these declines actually took place just recently because the stock was trading like 200 at the beginning of the week. So it's blown through your strike. How much are you now being paid? Step one, figure out how much extrinsic value there is to the option. 200 strike put, $176.5 stock price. This thing is $23.5 in the money, right? I'm using round numbers. It actually closed 176 bot 54. 176 and a half, so 200 minus 176 and a half, that's 23 and a half dollars. 26 bucks minus 23 and a half bucks, again, just to keep things easy, means that I'm collecting two and a half dollars between now and April expiration. Is that a good rate of pay? Forgive me, I just need to, someone's calling me, just need to kill that. Is that a good rate of pay? I would argue no, uh, because two and a half dollars on a stock like Tesla, uh, I would hope, I would hope at the very least that if you're looking to collect some premium, you're going to get at least 1% a month, at least, but preferably a whole lot more. This thing moves, right? So 1% a month is not a great amount of premium to be collecting to insure a stock like Tesla. Um, and that's demonstrated by the fact that the stock's moved more than $20, $20 this week. And this is, by the way, not a knock on this trade, and it's not a knock on selling premium. I want to be very clear about that, uh, because like I said, we short a lot of premium in a lot of places. We actually have a position in Tesla, as it happens. Um, but you want to make sure you're being compensated sufficiently for the risk you're taking. And I don't think that that is. So if I was in this position, I would roll it. So let's take a look and say, okay, well, I'm going to kill this. What if I was selling something closer to at the money? How much am I collecting now? So if I sold the 175s, I'm getting nine and a half bucks in premium to insure it at 175. All right, well, that's a little bit more reasonable to be sure. Uh, because, you know, nine and a half, again, the way I like to think about things, nine and a half bucks over the strike, that's where you're going to be forced to buy the stock if somebody puts it to you. That's 5.4%, and that's 5.4% over six weeks, right? So I'm actually getting damn near 1% a week to, to take that risk on. And if I have the stock put to me, I can then write against it. That's the good news. What's the bad news? Well, the bad news is that your probability of profit is not really, really great. You can see, okay, because the whole objective here when you're selling options is that you are hoping, number one, that you get, get the premium, and number two, that you're actually not going to have to pay off. You're selling insurance. The best thing that can happen is that you charge as much as you can for the insurance, but that nobody ever makes a claim. So here, yeah, 63% chance you get away with it. That's okay. Um, I would probably prefer to see that bump up. How do you figure out where your probability is? The answer is that the chances... It's actually found in one of the Greeks. It's found in delta. So a del the delta of an option is the hedge ratio. So when I was a market maker, which I am no longer, if I sold a put, the delta is how much stock I would need to sell to hedge that. And that amount floats up and down. But it's interesting because mathematically, it works out that the chances that that option expires in the money are is going to be approximately equivalent to the delta. So what is um, what is the delta? You know, if I go down to 165, I'm reducing how much I collect. I'm still getting a heck of a lot more than 1% of the strike per month here, but I'm going to have improved my probability of profit to 70%. I was just looking at selling a 30 delta option. So that's kind of what I like to, to look to trying to get that uh, probability of profit to about 70%. Now, here's an interesting thing. Uh, um, so anyway, that's, let's stick to that. So let's get to another question here, because um, I'm just making some of these last too long, um, and I want to make sure that I get efficient. So we had uh, one here on Costco. Where did I just put that? I thought I sent it to the screen. Did I accidentally delete that? X expectation from costs and selling a March 8th weekly 170, 160 put spread. I assume that's what you're doing.
Oh, that was from last, okay. This was actually an older question, but let's just take a look here. That doesn't really make much sense. Hmm. How could you, you're not gonna get anything for a 171.60. That's way, way too far out of the money. So I am wondering whether the cost might be related to something else. It can't be related to Costco. We have a position in Costco too, so. Uh, okay. All right, let's take a look at this one. Broadcom, AVGO. Okay. Uh, let's see here. I am in vMix Social. Let's see what we got here. Um, <laughs> let's see here. If an investor's view of the market will go down, is it better to buy a SPY put spread or sell my SPY and buy a call spread to keep participating? Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. This is an interesting question. Um, let's take a look at that. Let's take a look at that. We're going to actually, we're going to do this two ways. So I'm going to assume that you own some SPY. We're just going to say you own 100 shares of SPY. That's one possibility. Or actually, we'll just assume you have 100 shares of SPY. We'll take a look at how that behaves. We'll assume that you have 100 shares of SPY and you hedge that with a put spread. And then we'll do another trade. So here we're just going to take a look at the stock. So I'm going to say, okay, oops, sorry. So I'm going to say, okay, you own 100 shares of the stock. We're going to buy a put spread against that thing. Uh, stocks, you know, use downside one. What the heck? 505. I'm going to buy that put. And I'll sell it further out of the money put. Let's say we're going to do... I don't know that it really matters because we're just going to illustrate it with a comparable diff. Let's make it $20. Why not? Okay. So here we have the stock. Okay. So this is what buying the stock looks like. Everybody's familiar. Straight line. Stock goes up 10%. You make 10%. Goes down 10%. You lose 10%. Easy math. Okay. Here we own the stock and we bought a put spread against it. And... This little red portion here is the difference between the current stock price, the strike of the put you bought, and the premium you spent to put the whole trade on. So basically what it does is it provides you with some insulation in the event that the stock you know, should fall. Okay, so this reduces your probability of profit because now the stock also needs to rise uh, by at least the premium you spent on your put spread. Okay, so that's what that shape looks like. And what if instead I said, okay, well, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna blow the stock out. I'm not gonna buy a put spread. I'm gonna buy a call spread instead. So here I did the 505-485. That's a $20 call spread. It was just out of the money by about five bucks. Now I'm gonna do essentially the same thing here, except this time I'm gonna use the 515s. Oops, did I get 515s? 515s, $20. So I'm gonna go 535. And that's what this looks like. Okay, so here too, just like owning the stock with the put spread, you need it to go higher by the premium you spent before you're going to make some money. And it also has to go through that strike. Um, whereas if I have the put spread, you know, it's kind of similar. The thing is that the put spread only offers me protection on my long stock down to the strike of the put that I sold. After that, one for one, I'm participating with the stock again. So it offers some protection, but not perfect protection. Owning a call spread limits your total risk to the amount of premium you spend. So that's the good news. What else can we do with a trade like this? Well, one thing you could potentially do, because you notice that both of these trades, they lose a little bit at spot and they lose a little bit of money below spot anyway. So you might say to yourself, well, can I narrow the gap between the break-even? And I keep covering this up, so that's not really that helpful. So this break-even over here, which I know you can't read, so I've got to stop doing that. Uh, so the break-even and the spot, is there something you can do? Well, there is. Uh, one of the things you can do is, potentially, you could say, well, what happens if I actually 
trade a call that's slightly in the money instead. So it behaves kind of like stock, but only down to that lower level. And maybe I want to have participation up to at least one standard deviation away like this. Okay, so now what do I end up with? Well, now I'm ending up with a position that behaves a lot like stock. My extrinsic premium, the amount I'm spending, has gone down. And so now if we get a, a real blowout and the market just sort of rolls over hard, um, you know, I'm getting some, I'm getting some meaningful protection. And to that point, um, interesting day yesterday. Uh, this is just an aside. Because a lot of the stocks that have been doing the heavy lifting to carry the S&P recently didn't perform very well at all. Obviously, we had that disappointing news out of Apple, Apple, China, iPhone sales. You know, Microsoft, Apple, NVIDIA, these names are the biggest constituents in the S&P. So when something hurts one of them, that's going to hurt the S&P. And Alphabet, of course, was, was hurt recently as well. All of that Gemini nonsense and, you know, that stock hasn't been performing. I just find that price action pretty interesting. Um, let's just take a look at a couple of those stocks real quick because I, I think it's kind of important. Um, I don't mind having my hedges on right now, I have to tell you, uh, with what's going on. And I generally, you know, I'm, a, I'm somebody who's generally long the market. You know, stocks generally go up. Here's Apple. Um, this is just the last month. That's not a pretty picture. Uh, and by the way, uh, my friend and, and colleague from CNBC, Carter Worth, he put out a piece. He basically identified a 40-year trend in Apple, dating back to 1983, if you can believe it. And I was on the phone with another trader yesterday, and I asked him, I said, how old are you? <laughs> he said, he was I don't know, 41, 42 years old. And I said, you know, Carter just sent me a piece about Apple's 40-year trend. So basically when you were two, the trend he's identifying. To the penny, to you, anybody who watches Carter Worth, they know. To the penny, to the penny, to the penny, to the penny. He has a perfect wedge. And it violated that trend to the downside. Okay, so that was that one. Alphabet, this is a name I, I actually happen to like. We own it. We are hedged. But... This Gemini business has really not been great. Um, so this one's not looking so hot. Um, by the way, you know, it's interesting. Somebody else had asked about Super Micro, and I've been giving that one a little bit more thought as well. We'll talk about that um, a little bit later. Um, Amazon obviously behaving a little bit better. But I will tell you that my own view uh, is that it, things do feel a little bit fragile. Uh, and I've noticed also one other funny thing. Uh, the price of three-month options in the S&P to three-month options in all of the major single-stock constituents of the S&P is epically low right now. The cost to hedge your equity portfolio with the S is incredibly, incredibly cheap. Um, and I know we're bumping up against it time-wise. I think I got about eight more minutes. Let's, ah, here we are. This was, the, this was the Costco trade. I'm putting it up there now, I think. This makes much more sense. Uh, somebody just told me they did not mean the uh, 170, 160. They were talking about the 770, 760 for Costco. All right. <laughs> Yeah, that definitely makes a whole lot, a whole lot more sense. And uh, short version, we actually, Costco is one of the short vol names that we have in this portfolio of names that I have where I'm long index vol, short constituent vol. This is one of the short ones. And that's because it's, um, all of these major stocks are part of what we typically refer to as the dispersion basket. These are the, these are the index constituents that matter. So um, I like the trade. Um, the one quick thing I would add, though, and this is Costco always trades at a, at a very rich multiple. We were just joking about this the other day, and that is that um, if you're a retailer and you make your money from 
selling goods, you're worth about half as much as a retailer that makes the same amount of money make, <laughs> serving the same number of customers, except that you get those profits not from selling the goods, but from subscription fees. And that's the story with Costco, right? So Costco has a subscription-based model. You have to be a member. And now look what's happening. Amazon does this through Amazon Prime. Walmart Plus is doing this. And Target announced earnings. We are long that stock. It obviously crushed it. As anybody's been paying attention, it was up huge yesterday. It was up another three plus percent, I think, or something like that today. I actually wasn't watching how it closed. And what are they talking about? Subscriptions. <laughs> So, um, and Costco, by the way, is also a Holly Index name. The issue here um, is that this thing is going to be reporting earnings. And they're going to be reporting earnings tomorrow. So, usually, as I pointed out before, I love selling premium, but I like to sell premium outside of the events. So, if I was going to be selling premium on this name... I'd probably more likely try to sell premium by getting into a calendar spread. And what calendar would I buy? I would want to own options that expire longer dated than not the earnings are reporting tomorrow, but the next one after that. That's May 24th, by the way. So May, regular way May expiration is going to work. You'd have to go out June, July, something like that. Okay. That is 45 minutes. I apologize if you put in a question and I did not respond to it. I care. I will try to get to those. Um, and I will try to write back to you, actually. So I really appreciate you um, putting these comments and questions in. We really welcome your suggestions because this is a new thing for me and this is a new format. And we're just trying to make sure that this, this works well for everybody. Like, subscribe, tell your friends, and join us when we come back uh, next week, which we will do Monday, 4.15. See you then.